Hey everyone, Larry Chen here. Today we're gonna do something different. My friends at Pennzoil actually asked us to help them with their Long May We Drive campaign. We're actually going to feature a couple of stunt drivers that are personal friends of mine to get a little more insight on what they do. These individuals get behind the wheel and drive for a living. They're passionate about it and they love it. And I wanted to hear a little bit of the insight of what it's like actually to be a stunt driver, what it's like to be in the spotlight and what it's like to perform under pressure. What does Lawn May We Drive actually mean? Penzoil is such a big supporter of ours. They support so many incredible projects. We get to shoot NASCAR, we get to shoot Pikes Peak, we get to shoot Formula Drift. We get to shoot car culture in general because they want to support the true enthusiasts. They want to help us celebrate the joy, the privilege, the absolute freedom that we get from driving, pushing, and enjoying our vehicles on the racetrack, on the street, in the canyons, going sideways, doing burnouts, whatever you love, they wanna support it. For this first episode, we follow our really good friend, Reese Millen, as he attempts to break the overall production car record in his Pennzoil BMW M8. I've been shooting with Reese for so many years and it was incredible to sit down and chat with him and hear his incredible stories. exciting this is something new something yeah. that I've never done before on this channel just a couple hours ago we were both up on the top section of Pikes Peak you were driving your BMW M8 yep and I was on the side of the track taking pictures of you I saw you in multiple locations yeah yeah, yeah. well you saw me completely out of breath at multiple <laughs> locations <laughs> <laughs> yes, um, I'm cheating with oxygen, so uh, yeah, definitely helps. We're actually by your vehicle that you parked here in this amazing Pikes Peak Heritage Museum. And we actually are here to talk a little bit about Pikes Peak, but also you have a really good story to relate it to your stunt driving career as well. Sure. And yep. then of course, it's hard not to touch on Formula Drift. I mean, that's where I had a chance to meet you for the first time and also work with you for many years. Where should we start? I don't even know where to start. Yeah, well, uh, you know, the shirt kind of says it all, racing and stunts. Starting in motorsport at 19, my second race ever was Pikes Peak in the Pikes Peak Open Division, which I won all gravel course on a gravel tire then. And then that really built a foundation. You know, you have to go back before social media, before anything. You had to win to produce a result to get sponsorship. And that was eight long years of working at that and focusing specifically on this event. It had national broadcast, it had international broadcast, it had print publication, it had everything. So I didn't have the money to do a full championship in another series, so I put all my investment and all my passion into this event. So it was really a foundation of a skill set that was sliding a car around, but you were sliding for speed. Um, along came drifting, uh, say 10 plus years later, and that was a form of style of driving that was rallying or drifting up Pikes Peak in the dirt that I naturally progressed into. So the point of this series 
is to focus on people that actually drive for a living. We're talking about pushing these vehicles to the absolute physical limit. And that's what you do for work. Yeah. But that's what you do day in and day out. Not to mention us being here, you know, this morning, you pushing 10 tents up on that mountain. I mean, I just cannot believe how much you guys are able to push, not really knowing how much traction there is, but having a pretty good idea. Yeah, the greatest thing about the mountain for me is is just that coming out of coming out of the hole, uh, getting that first green flag. You know, throughout the practices that we usually have leading into this race week, you'll have five days up on the mountain that you can build up to speed. With the weather that we've had this year, the upper section was not available. So it's been 12 months and a new car. And that first time out, we were only four seconds slower than my fastest time after four runs. So I went three and a half seconds quicker and then could only find one second and then two tenths of a second and I was plateaued after four runs. So it's an exciting element as a driver to come out of the gate hot and do a heater and get as much as you can out of it and really commit to the road that you're familiar with, but applying the car to the road that you haven't connected yet. So it's one of the things that I get as a personal satisfaction out of the event. I think my favorite uh, memory from photographing you at Pikes Peak is you winning overall oh, in yeah. 2012 yep. in a drift car, in your <laughs> actual formula drift car. Like, <laughs> Nothing changed except, I'm uh, assuming, brakes, and maybe you took the steering angle out. I don't know what else. <laughs> yeah, actually, actually, you know, going into a little bit of detail about that, we won, I believe, uh, Las Vegas Drift in the Genesis, put it in a trailer, hit it out here, and the day before tech, we were changing spring rates, same shocks, knuckles, to adapt to a bigger brake, pulling out the handbrake, putting a big wing on it, a front splitter, different wheel and tire, and rolling it through tech for race day. So yeah, that car did time attack, it did drift, and it did Pikes Peak. And then after that, you turned it back into a drift car and then competed the rest of the Formula Drift season. Yep, <laughs> yep, which we finished uh, third that championship with a crash that uh, maybe shouldn't have happened to Irwindale, but it was between Daigo Saito and me for the championship. And uh, I just went in a little too deep onto that inboard wall, which has caught a lot of people out. Yeah, I remember that event specifically as honestly probably the most exciting Irwindale that's ever happened because it was a six weight championship. Yeah. Like six of you guys, any one of you guys could have had it. Yeah, I think you know? Chris was in the hunt. I think Vaughn was in the hunt. Die. Um, die. Yeah. yeah, there was quite a JTP, few of us. JTP, bunch yep. of people. Yep. What I want to know is how does Pikes Peak relate to your, I would say the not your nine to five job, which is actually stunt driving. You know, it's very it's very similar in many many ways. The pressure's far less for me. Stunt work is if we don't get it, we roll camera again. We reset to one and we go again. Racing doesn't give you that opportunity. You have to find every tenth and every corner if it's braking, turn in, roll speed, and corner exit. And then I applied that a lot to the stunt world. For me, getting the shot in one and moving on is really important, as would it be for you if you frame the shot up and you go click, click, or just click, and you've got that magic shot. So from a creative standpoint, I want to invest into the, the commercial or the feature film or the TV show by trying to nail it in one and keep the momentum going. That I've been able to get from racing. To put it into perspective as maybe like an iconic moment for me, Fast and the Furious 7, we filmed up on Pikes Peak. Yeah, so it's like, I know this place. Yeah, yeah. yeah no problem. Yeah. Let me have it. So, like, tell me a little bit about that. So at, at that point, there was two or three renditions of Fast and the Furious. Tokyo Drift was one that I got bored in earlier on. That was Fast and the Furious 3, and had a lot of the Drift guys then that were popular and bought them in. Samuel Hubinet, Tanner Faust, Ernie Fixmer. Gosh, I could go on and on, but there was a lot of guys that I bought in for that event. But then going back to Fast and the Furious 7, where we shot on the mountain, it was an opportunity for me to double Paul Walker, who I'd done in the previous, in five, I think it was, and a little bit in six. 
and then come up here and drive some really cool cars and do a scene that was a combination of all my motorsport at that point. It was an off-road scene down the face of a mountain that started on the tarmac, turned off, and then we had this crazy cable system. So applying dirt driving, pavement racing, off-road racing, all in a feature film was kind of a, a gift come true. Yeah, I remember that scene specifically where you guys are uh, just driving through double cut area. Yep. And I was like, I know where that is. And then it like switches to another part of the mountain. I was like, that's not right. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's, it's interesting if you guys want to check out Fast and Furious Tokyo Drift again, in the airplane scene, you actually make a cameo oh, in that. Oh, three, so yep. Is that the only time you're actually, your face yeah. is actually in the movies we, or in, in the Fast and Furious series? Yeah, we did two and a half months of nights and we got off at like, I think seven in the morning and they gave me a phone call and they're like, hey, do you want to come over and do this plane scene? So I rolled into there straight till like midday and we did that scene. So that was that was quite an honor to be asked to be to do that. Quite Ta fun. Talk about a rite of passage for yeah. like a, a car guy, stunt guy. And I mean, Fast and Furious, as coiny as it is, you can't deny the fact that it's made such an impact on all of us. Oh, incredible franchise. Yep. Yeah. Yep. And yeah. my company had an opportunity to build a lot of those cars as well. You know, the RX-8, the RX-7s, the Silvias, um, everything for Fast and Furious 3. Then we did Fast and Furious 8. When they went to Iceland, we put together a bunch of Subaru WRXs, wide body kits and roll cages and all sorts of things. So throughout the franchise, I've had opportunities to drive and to build cars and everything. So it's been fun to connect with it. But I really think that Fast and the Furious 7, where I doubled pole in the Subaru at the start for about a week up here. And then I went in most, mostly my main position was doubling Jason Statham in this kind of funky off-road vehicle that they had. So a vivid scene that I recall from Fast and the Furious 7 was this mountainside that we had and we had this like weight sled. So I'm in this off-road buggy sort of military style vehicle and I've got a pulley system tied to the back of the vehicle. This is about a 60 degree slope going through trees and rocks and bumps up to a pulley, to a secondary pulley, to a rail system with a weight sled on it. So they would reset me to one by pulling the weight down to the bottom and the car to the top of the hill. Now there's two of us side by side. Steve Kalsa was the other driver and he was in like a, kind of like a Dodge Charger, the black one with the red stripes and the tires and the trunk. And then on action, we're asked at about 50, 60 miles an hour just to fire it down the mountain and there's no way you're going to stop but the way that this weight system worked as we accelerated down the mountain the weight system coming up to a pulley to a stop system and you would just go and stop at the bottom great got it reset pretty pretty amazing to be a part of that so how much control do you actually have with the vehicle or are you just along they, for the they were ride? just on a tether so you it, legit suspension v8 engines you know everything there it was just the stop at the end that would haul you in from say 50 miles an hour to zero in about 20 feet right okay yeah. so because otherwise there's just no way for you to physically stop because of, of the angle. Oh, 100%. Or, or the, you would have just gained was. more speed. Yeah, kind of like, a, say, a Le Mans car when it hits wet grass. <laughs> it doesn't stop, it keeps going faster. Got it. Yeah, so that was, a, that was a really cool moment. And then we had all of these other parts of the scene that was sliding on cliffs and crashing into each other and everything. Out of that, if you look at, say, an actor winning the highest goal or award would be like a, an Oscar. For the stunt community, it's called the Tour Stunt Award. So that year I actually won the Tour Stunt Award for best performance with a vehicle. So to be connected to the movie industry, um, the Fast and the Furious franchise, to connect that event to my roots at Pikes Peak from where I started racing was, was, was pretty cool. That's awesome. I hope you guys are enjoying this episode. We choose Pennzoil because of what they stand for. This year, their campaign is Long May We Drive. What does that mean? Well, they just wanna make sure the culture that we love and the things that we love to do, which is driving cars, enjoying cars, they just want to make sure it lasts as long as possible. That means the ultimate protection for the engine, however high performing it is, 
and also that means better gas mileage. Thanks to Penzoil for supporting this project as well as supporting everything that we do. It's hard to not relate me to the story because of the fact that I've been around for so many of these iconic moments that you've, you in the car, you pushing hard, and luckily for me, I'm able to be on the outside capturing it. But not that long ago, the roles, I wouldn't say they were re reversed, but they were different. You were doing your stunt driving in a Toyota commercial. Yep, yep. In the GR Corolla. GR Corolla. <laughs> and yep. for whatever reason, Toyota wanted me in the commercial playing myself and you would basically rudely interrupt me as I was setting up a shot. But it was just so interesting because it's just a different way to be a part of this industry that I was just not used to. Yeah, yep. You know, only up until pretty recently I started being in front of the camera. I've, I was in, behind the camera for whatever, 15 years before I stepped in front of the camera. And to be a part of a production that big just absolutely blew my mind. I couldn't even read the names on the call sheet because of how many names there were oh, on yeah. the call sheet. It's I, insane. I've yeah. just never seen so many people on set. Of course, you're used to that. <laughs> yeah. But what I was really surprised with was that you had to push that vehicle so hard because it's a stock vehicle, not modified for sliding or drifting. And the odds were against you. So tell me a little bit about that. Yeah, so that's, as you say, my nine to five, some uh, 150 to 200 days a year shooting TV commercials for different manufacturers, different products. Sometimes they're you know, uh, soft drinks, sometimes you're sliding through a, a pickup, uh, you know, fast food joint for Taco Bell or whatever it is. But in this particular case, it was a, a great campaign for Toyota. Uh, we actually did the uh, AE86, the, the Supra, and this one as you're referencing the GR Corolla. One of the things that people may not really appreciate, as you said, is how hard you have to work with a stock vehicle uh, and the restrictions that a stock vehicle presents. In the world of drifting, as much air angle as you can design into the chassis, as much horsepower, the best hydraulic brake, the best steering, everything you want. You can almost be a little sloppy and get away with it. In a production car, if your brake pressure to throttle pressure is within 2%, it'll shut you down. Um, so doing specific maneuvers, weight transfer, in this case, this car is four-wheel drive, but has a bit of a drift mode, but it's still gonna bind the front in track mode, I believe it was. Um, a hydraulic handbrake that's stretching the cable like drift cars were 20 plus years ago. So you have to be on your point. You have to be able to make the car act, but you really have to understand what the director's vision is. So for me, I'll go do a slide and then I'll run over to the monitor and get his input. Because if you're disconnected, you could do the same slide a hundred times. You might, in some cases, and in this case, I had to overthrow the slide to get the hero moment where the car physically won't travel straight, but you had to make it straight, and then it kind of spins out, out of frame. I love that because I remember reading the brief and actually looking at the storyboard. And the storyboard is that you're, you're basically drifting and getting the nose under my lens. Right, you right. know, but then the next page is like legal, you know, it has to be 50 feet. <laughs> That's right. I right? totally forgot about <laughs> yeah. that. So, and uh, legal came out with their tape measure. Exactly. And said, do it again, move further away. Right. Yeah. But, but the crazy thing about that is it was still pretty close in that when I saw you push the car and like you said, over rotate it for the shot. At the end, the landing wasn't pretty. Like no. you, you almost hit the building, I oh, feel like, building, a couple of times. Then we had the arm car there that was in my way going around. So, and that's the part that people don't get. They're like, oh, I can do that. And it's like, well, you need to understand the restraints. There's no run out. You've got an arm car and an arm, your, your camera on the end of the crane tracking you. And you've got to make all of these defined adjustments to, to get the shot, but still stay in control. And then, not to mention, if I mess up my part, we gotta you, do it again. You have to do it again. And I feel like, you know, I, I waited, I don't even know how many hours on set for that moment. 
And then when we started doing it, we did it basically until there was no more light. Yeah. You know, yeah. We, we shot it over and over and over. And you know what? The end product was so cool. I was so excited to be a part of it. It's just so cool to see a little bit of a glimpse into your life, what you do for work. How did it get to that point? Well, you could go way, way back. <laughs> 1994 was my first introduction into the film industry. Uh, 1992 I started racing. In 94 um, I was still very active on mountain bikes. I'd raced mountain bikes in New Zealand, I'd raced mountain bikes in the US. So I actually got into the film industry doing mountain bike stunts. There was a casting for a Ford commercial that they were going to cast on camera talent for a guy to, to represent the brand in a lifestyle commercial. He's mountain biking, he's throwing his mountain bike in his truck, He's acting on camera with a couple of glan glances to camera and a smile, bombing through sand dunes and over terrain, and, and that's the commercial. Jeff Zwart was the director, and my father and Jeff had been friends for years. I'd known Jeff since I was six years old. So Jeff kind of leveraged the agency. Rather than paying three talent, why don't we get one guy that can do all three roles? That was my step into stunt driving at that point. And from there, I got to drive from Jeff for years and then got exposed to other campaigns and other manufacturers and other directors. And then now you've been racing against him for, for yeah, so many, for many years. years. For many years, yep. but also you're still working with him as a, a stunt driver in a lot of his campaigns. Yep. Yeah. So, so through Jeff, I got introduced to a lot of different brands and a lot of different styles of driving, expanded on my off-road base. And then I think outside of the feature films, the TV commercials are my, where my focus is. It keeps me home, it keeps me close to my family. And one of the most kind of iconic, I'll call them a TV commercial, but it was really these short films that we did with Pennzoil called Joyride. We went around the world for four years and we did lots of firsts and lots of directors since then referenced these points. So Joyride was kind of like a campaign where you were an elite membership and you had access to these really cool cars. We went to Cape Town when the Dodge Hellcat uh, was first released. We went to Kananaskis Mountains in Calgary in the snow with a BMW M4. We went to Nürburgring in, in a BMW. We went down the city streets of Miami in a Dodge Viper for the last Viper off the showroom or off the, off the assembly line. And you could look these up. These are Last Viper, Tundra, Baja with a Jeep in, in Mexico, and then Joyride. And those films kind of reestablished the performance culture of driving and drifting into kind of now everything that you see on a TV commercial. Those films, along with the BMW films. I don't know if you remember those. Yeah. All those years ago. Well, randomly, Matt Mullins, who's my teammate here uh -huh. this year, was part of the BMW films. Th those films really inspired me all those years ago. As a young kid looking up and seeing, you know, what's possible, it really blew me away to see those. And then now, we actually reference those videos in yep. our office yep. when we're talking about what's possible when it comes to a car just getting pushed to the limit. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's uh, the sound design also on those. Oh, it was very, very good. Yeah, yeah. So good. Yeah. If you guys haven't seen them, definitely go check those films out. Yeah. And, you, and your passion has been behind the camera, as you mentioned, um, through the lens, creating that shot. But then you also have a passion for driving. And, yeah. then, and then for me, it's very, very similar, very parallel. I want to make the car act, that's what I'm hired to do. But I also jump in with the director and set up the shots because I understand the vehicle dynamics. I will place the camera or get creative with the camera in the last Viper in, in Miami. We stuck it right down on the curb and the curb had an entryway on a crosswalk and I popped the front tire off and over the camera sliding through the wheels and everything. So it's it's my outlet from my creative design. I do all the liveries on all my race cars, the BMW mm -hmm. this year, uh, and all the other cars. So what I can do from the driver's seat, I try to contribute from if I could control the lens and the steering wheel at the same time. Yeah, what, one of the things I always say, I'm very candid about this, and I say this all the time, I got into this because of driving and because of, lo of a love for cars. Yep. While I love photography and video, being on the outside 
I honestly would much rather be in, <laughs> drive be in the car. Yeah. With that said, after all these years, I've been able to combine the two. Uh, oh, this, you're, this you're, past year at Formula Drift. Your chase runs? Yeah, That's for whatever amazing. reason, Formula Drift has embraced me, it, do it, has yeah. allowed me to do both at the same time. Yep. And I haven't had a chance to chase you while you're drifting, but uh, you should maybe, chase me up Pikes Peak. Yeah, that would be cool. <laughs> <laughs> maybe maybe you should be sliding your drift car. Yeah, drift you can car. chase Mad Mike. He's dri he's sliding everywhere. He is. Yeah. He is. Yeah. Uh, we've been uh, able to get some cool shots of him sliding awesome. that thing around. Thanks for sitting down with me. I know it's a crazy week for you. It's definitely a crazy week for us. But I mean, look at this. Yeah. This, can we just talk about this car real quick? <laughs> so this means a lot to me seeing this here because in 2011, that was actually my first year coming to Pikes Peak and it was the last year of the dirt. And in 2017, I became the official photographer. and. It's such an honor to me and I take it so seriously because of the fact that many years down the line, my photos are, are going to be what's telling the story of these sure. cars, of these racers, of you, of you and yep. everyone else you're competing against. I remember specifically seeing this on race day, you know, right bef below ski area at that hairpin. Yep. And just seeing you create this crazy cloud of dust. I mean, because this thing has so much arrow. Oh yeah. And you're just shooting dust. I don't even know, basically blocking the trees. Yeah. And it was just incredible to see. Yeah, this guy was, was kind of special. It was an inspiration from my, my father's Toyota Tacoma that ran and was built maybe 10 years before this car. And we went with this kind of Le Mans style vehicle because the road was changing. In 2001 or 2002, they started uh, paving one mile of the mountain uh, each year and was finished in, at the end of 2011. Uh, for 2012, which miraculously, I don't know how I won overall that year and set a new course record in 2012, but prior to that, it was all of this, these progression throughout these the, the years. So in 2011, I approached Hyundai to build a car that would progress with the road. Unfortunately, Hyundai didn't have a motorsport department. They just had an activation within different experimental sports is what they called it. So they were into motorsport, they were out, they were in, they were out. And that was my career with them for six years. But we had an opportunity to present this program as the evolution of the road would change. We were building not a dirt car, but a pavement car. This car is uh, 1,820 pounds. It was powered by the same engine that we used in the drift car. So it was a 3.8 liter Lambda Hyundai V6 that we stroked to 4.1 liters. It was turbocharged, made about 850 horsepower and was four wheel drive. So it was a very unique setup for a Le Mans style car being four wheel drive. Center seat with the drive shaft running through my leg to the front differential was a little scary. Um, and the car made around 2,000 pounds of downforce. So if you have an opportunity to look at the car here in the museum, it's got big tunnels, big wings, and, and it worked really well. We just were waiting for that following year for the road to be all pavement, and the program got axed. Oh. You know, in terms of ahead of its time, it just, it really was. Yeah, yeah. It was like one year ahead of its time, yep. essentially, <laughs> yeah. Yep. Just super cool to see that it's here living in the museum, uh, along with so many other historic race cars. But uh, thanks again. Um, yeah, it's it's been a crazy journey so far. I know I'm gonna be photographing you for a long time behind the wheel. I hope so. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Larry.